I'm here with John Everard. Now, John is the former British ambassador to North Korea for Great Britain. Uh, he's had the fairly unique experience of living there for two years. Two and a half. Two and a half years in Pyongyang, uh, North Korea's capital city. Um, so, John, thank you for coming on the podcast. Not at all. If you could just start by giving us a little bit about your background and your, your history with North Korea. Yeah, sure. Uh, I, I'm a Korea diplomat, or at least I wasn't until I retired. And I got into North Korea really quite late in my career. I had been uh, specializing in Northeast Asia in general, sure, uh, and a lot of the time in Latin America. But I only actually got into the Korean Peninsula in 2005 when I was selected as ambassador uh, to Pyongyang and was sent to South Korea for language training. Uh, but it's kind of um, you know, become a, a major theme of my life ever since. I was ambassador there, as you just said, yes. uh, for two and a half years, from 2006 to 2008. Uh, but since then, I've worked on all kinds of North Korean related issues. I've written a book about uh, my experience as ambassador. And for a year and a half or so, I coordinated the United Nations Security Council panel of experts on North Korea, which is tasked with ensuring proper implementation of Security Council sanctions. And since then, I've, I've written, I've broadcast, um, I've, I've been deeply involved in the great debate about what to do with North Korea. So I've, uh, I've been doing it now for quite some time. And it is, I suppose, it's quite a niche subject, I think you mentioned in your book, which I haven't quite finished reading yet, but very much enjoyed so far. Um, one of the things that stood out for me is, I think, right before the preface of the book, there's a line which was uh, just sort of aptly worded saying, this is for the people of North Korea who deserve better or yes. deserve more, I think which sort of raised a few questions for me because you go to great lengths in the book to conceal the identity of the people that you worked and lived by or you know, from within North Korean society. And it made me think just sort of in a journalistic context that the reporting you've seen, I've seen done, and I think John Sweeney's panorama trip is one that stands out. They're very sort of gung-ho. These people are effectively in a controlled state where if they say the wrong thing, this could have huge ramifications for them and all their family. And I just wanted to get your view on, in particular, that John Sweeney episode where I think he went in with the London School of Economics. What are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's sort of journalistically justifiable, pressuring people into questioning on camera things about the regime they may not be permitted to talk about? You know, I, I think the North Koreans can generally look after themselves. And yeah. if they don't want to say something on camera, they're not going to say it. Uh, to be honest, uh, if you run that documentary again, I think you'll find that the most interesting bits were the bits he shot outside North Korea. Yes. Uh, the sections that he shot in North Korea are frankly disappointing and stunningly uninformative. Yes. Uh, North Koreans are not going to commit political and possibly physical suicide by telling a foreign journalist that they hate the regime on camera. They're not stupid. Yes. Uh, and you know, trying to get them to do so was, frankly, you know, bound to end in failure. The, you, you, you got much more mileage out of talking to North Koreans who were safely outside the country and who felt clearly much more able to speak their minds. And do you think... So I actually visited North Korea a couple of years ago. I went on the train actually from Dandong. It's the first sort of group of people that were allowed in after the Ebola or Ebola justification of closing the border. They kind of said, you know, it's because of that. But obviously, I think it was more political reasons with Beijing and what have you. And one of the things that was amazing was, as just sort of alluding to what you just said, actually, is that going in through the countryside, you just see the sort of level of poverty. You, know, you see the TV footage of military parades. But going in through, I say, from Dandong into Pyongyang was just, I couldn't believe the level of poverty. I couldn't believe that the land, was, I think it was in quite a big drought at the time. So it was, you know, every inch was farm. I'm so glad you raised the point. Yes. Uh, there's a terrible tendency uh, when we talk about North Korea to fixate on the threats it presents to the international community. Uh, missile launches, nuclear tests and so on. The, it is also a very poor country. I think it was just last week that the United Nations uh, World Food Programme uh, produced an analysis of food needs in North Korea that showed that 41% of the population were food insecure, uh, which is UN speak for hungry. Yeah. Uh, that they are getting... No, no, they don't appear to be starving, but they are badly nourished 
uh, both in the sense that they're not getting enough food and in the sense too that what food they do get is is not a balanced diet. It, it tends to be quite heavily carbohydrates uh, based, uh, a lack of protein and uh, a lack of all kinds of, of, of trace elements that we all need even in small amounts uh, right. to, to keep healthy. Poverty is a very big issue. Revolution? Look, nobody knows. I certainly don't know. Uh, the thing about revolutions, especially in tightly controlled states like North Korea, yeah. is you never get advance notice of them. They just happen. There's a good bang. Uh, if there is a revolution in North Korea, the first you and I will know about it is turning on our television screens and discovering, I don't know, tanks in the streets of Pyongyang or, or whatever form it takes. Important to remember that there have been attempts in the past to overthrow the regime, including some quite determined ones. Yes. Uh, there was one the Sixth Corps, uh, which is the part of the North Korean army, as used to be, they've reformed since, but it used to be up in the northeast of the country, attempted a military coup about 20 odd years ago. And it was suppressed and everybody involved was shot. But we only discovered this because defectors started to tell us about it. There was another famous attempt in the late 60s uh, where a group of, what do you call them, Potter, plotters, anyway, they, you know, quite senior cadres, had plotted a peaceful exchange of power by trying to vote down Kim Il-sung, who was in charge at the yes. time, uh, in the Supreme People's Assembly. And the attempt failed. But the only reason that the outside world knew about this was because the plotters actually walked into the Soviet embassy at the time and told the Soviet ambassador what they wanted to do. Uh, they were asking for Soviet support, which of course wasn't forthcoming. Had they not done that, the world probably would never have heard about quite a determined attempt to yes. overthrow the regime. So how many others are going on right now? You know, we're all guessing. One point worth remembering, that when the regime killed Kim Jong-nam, yes. uh, Kim Jong-un's half-brother in Kuala Lumpur Airport earlier yes. this year, uh, it must have been for a reason. You don't go around bumping off members of your own royal family just for fun. And the most likely reason is that they thought that he might have been a focus for opposition to Kim Jong-un. Uh, so the regime at least seems to believe that there is a risk of sedition from inside. With respect to Kim Jong-nam, and again, I'm sort of, I'd never really have heard of the man until this assassination in Kuala Lumpur. It seemed like his lifestyle was more, it certainly wasn't involved politically, or so it seemed. And I was just wondering, is it possibly more is it more telling of a madman's actions, a kind of a despotic Kim Jong-un who is trying to silence anyone who's ever betrayed him? Do you think it's a possibility that it's more of an insight into his sort of paranoia, if you like, as a kind of despotic leader? Wouldn't we love to be able to answer that question? <laughs> uh, the Kim Jong-nam, no, he, Kim Jong-nam said in, in terms that he had no intention of taking power. And sure enough, his lifestyle bore this out. Yes. Um, he was, how to put this politely, just a little bit on the chubby side. Uh, and... He was frankly not always, when he gave interviews, which he did quite often, he didn't always come across as being either in full command of his facts or thinking either very deeply or very, uh, right. or very, very, very thoroughly. Um, you know, perhaps not leadership material, much more interested uh, in the flesh pots of Macau. He had at least two families on the go, one in Beijing, one in Macau, right. plus various mistresses. So he had a, a complicated love life. And, you know, I think the general consensus uh, outside Pyongyang was well, this man was a kind of amiable buffoon uh, going around wearing his strange newsboy caps. He sort of fancied himself as the kind of, kind of chic and cool, um, <laughs> occasionally giving interviews, uh, living out the good life, but otherwise keeping out of the way. Was Pyongyang right to take a different view? Was he a threat? Was the buffoonery just an act? Uh, or was it, as you suggest, paranoia in Pyongyang? We don't know. And the chances are we're never going to find out. Bit of background. Uh, the Zhang Song Tech, uh, Kim Jong Un's yes. uncle, of course, executed. But uh, Kim, no, uh, Zhang Song Tech was Kim Jong Un's mother's father. Right. Uh, mother's sister's husband. Sorry, I get. Uh, I, I want to go and check the family tree before I'm I sure went. Sure, it's a very that, complicated but, family yeah, but anyway, tree. <laughs> uncle, uncle will do fine. Um, the. But he was executed back in 2014, in December. Uh, something approaching a show trial and uh, you know all kinds of terrible charges leveled against him. People on the grapevine say the real reason that he was executed was not the charges formally brought against him, but that he, uh, Kim Jong-nam, Jong 
every month got a kind of what do you call it a stipend a living allowance from the North Korean regime right and a couple of months before the execution uh, Jang Song Tech had taken it upon himself to actually deliver this to Kim Jong Nam in person right. and probably in cash and Pyongyang had decided that the two were plotting were wow. they or, or was this just in the bit of paranoia again Paranoia in Pyongyang, as you mentioned earlier. Yes, paranoia, or do they know more than we do? Are there real plots against them? You know, just because they're paranoid doesn't mean they're wrong. Absolutely. So, with respect to sort of defectors, and it brings me on to the next thing I wanted to ask you about, which is about the labour camps, and just to give a little bit of background, I think Amnesty International estimates something like 200,000 people, I think Human Rights Watch 150, or maybe vice versa, respective organisations, but some of the witness accounts of the favoured methods of torture, forced abortions, some extremely grotesque and seemingly unique and brutality. One of the things that's always fascinated me is just the lack of sort of journalistic coverage of them. And I understand why. I understand that it's, you know, an inaccessible place. We rely on only from witness statements who are escapees who can sort of blow the whistle, so to speak. And I just wanted to know what is there anything that we can do in the West to sort of try and highlight this without creating a provocative situation with North Korea? Is there anything that Western governments should be doing for the plight of the, say, 200,000 people in prison camps or labour camps? Well, let's, let, let's start at the end. Uh, anything you do on any subject like this is going to provoke North Korea. So the quick answer to your question is no. Right. no if, if you do something, you've got to provoke them. Yep. But you know, is that really a good reason for not doing anything? Uh, the numbers are obscure, as you just said, 200, 250,000. The problem is that nobody is sure that we know where all the camps are. Some of them may well be underground, uh, particularly where you're using slave labour, Nazi style, to build weapons, and so invisible to the cameras on our satellites. And even the ones that we can uh, see from above ground, uh, the numbers are based on estimates of how many people you can cram into living accommodation, right. uh, which are probably broadly accurate, but only broadly. And yes. exact numbers are very hard to, to come by. So the numbers may be out by some way. It's worth pointing out too that I mean China um, a few years ago closed its labour camps but just before the closure China had roughly the same number of people in labour camps as North Korea. Wow. Now of course the population of China is just a little bit bigger Yes. Uh, so proportionately you know it's a very sort of stunning figure. Um, lack of journalistic coverage? Yes the trouble with covering these things is that journalists need facts and photographs and, and quotations yeah. to, to build their stories you know you um, and Amnesty International and other organizations have worked very hard to bring facts into the public domain but we are still pretty short of them and of course the North Koreans are in no mood to cooperate indeed they deny that these camps exist and they yeah. point out truly enough that no Western has ever seen them so you know, how do we know uh, and it means that you know if you try to to file a story on these camps and get it past your editor. Right. It, it looks a bit thin, to be honest. And Yeah, uh, I mean, it seems like the most <laughs> a kind of shortlisted piece for a Pulitzer Prize, certainly. I mean, imagine if some footage of these camps could be found or just, you know, leaked or something. It just seems like, when we're talking about numbers, let's say, for argument's sake, it's only 10,000 people. It's still a huge, huge story. And I always found it astonishing reading up about it, and I understand that the numbers are obscure, obviously it's hard to estimate from satellite imagery, you know, how many humans you can pram into a small space, I suppose. Things have changed a lot since the United Nations Commission of Inquiry uh, into the labour camps. Right. Uh, that came out two years ago, uh, produced by some very senior lawyers, independent, unpaid, they just donated their time, which was very good of them. Uh, and it's a pretty stomach-churning document. Uh, if listeners want to look at it, uh, there's a kind of abbreviated version which will give you the main highlights. Right. But I do urge anybody who's interested in this subject to look at the full version. Uh, I, it would take quite a long time to read the whole thing. Right. But that's the one with all the actual eyewitness accounts. Just don't read it before a big meal. It really <laughs> right. is seriously unpleasant. Yeah, I can um, imagine. And the United Nations has been processing the resulting documents because, of course, if you submit something like that, if you have a commission of inquiry, it doesn't just sit. Yes. It, it's now with the, sorry, with the Security Council who 
uh, have not actioned it. Uh, there's a lot of talk also about further action on human rights within the United Nations, but that is um, difficult because, of course, China is course, not a yeah. fan of, uh, of human rights actions in general for its own very good reason, and it doesn't want North Korea destabilized also for good reasons as seen from Beijing. So we don't know how far that will go. But for the first time, it does mean that we have got a, a credible document uh, detailing the abuses in these labor camps, and indeed more widely in North Korean society, on United Nations paper. It's quite a step forward. What are your hopes with that being enacted as a sort of a UN security resolution, sorry, security council resolution? Um, I wouldn't want to raise hopes that it's going to be passed or, or adopted, recognised, uh, in, but with the full weight of the Security Council behind it any time soon. Uh, things may change. I mean, China's policy to North Korea is not set in stone. China has its own interests to pursue, which do not always coincide yes. with those of North Korea. And if China changed its mind, decided that that was the way to go, then just possibly I might get it. But I really wouldn't encourage listeners to hold their breath. And would it be fair to say that China the political relationship appears to be growing a bit tired of Kim Jong-un's threats and his these missile tests. I mean, I think there was one that a ballistic missile was sent off towards the coast of Japan a few weeks ago, and which prompted the uh, response from the Trump, from the Trump, I was going to say regime then, but... Yeah, Trump <laughs> regime, why not? I mean, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yes, uh, let, let's, t let's talk about that. Uh, the It was sent towards Japan. Um, it was... It's hard to explain these things without sounding really, really nerdy. But in Go brief, <laughs> um, the, the missile was arced in a strange way. Right. And if you follow what would have been its natural trajectory, um, it would have landed in somewhere more provocative. But the point is that the natural trajectory was the exact range of the, uh, the, the principal United States military base in Japan. That was one of the missiles. Wow. The other one was sent the other way, but ranged so that it would, had they simply swung the missile launch pad round, yes. have hit the port of Busan in South Korea, which is where the United States would need to land its troops yes. to reinforce uh, South Korean, uh, the South Korean military. And I've seen the drills which they conduct on South Korean You've seen the drills, they're, they're that's right, okay. Huge. They, they are huge, that's right, well, there's a huge threat. Yeah. Uh, but that is where the United States would need to land uh, men, troops, equipment, uh, to bolster South Korea in the event of a North Korean threat. And at the time of the launch, the North Koreans said, I can't now quote the words, but we would use nuclear weapons to destroy the ability of the imperialists to reinforce the South Korean puppets. So the Rangers were not accidental. This was them demonstrating what they would do if the United States and South Korea ever infringe on North Korean sovereignty, to use one of their favorite phrases. And of course, it took place during the joint uh, South Korean American exercises. Effectively, uh, this was the uh, the North Koreans exercising their own. You know, you you, yeah. you, you have exercises which we regard a warning as shot, a warning shot. I suppose a warning shot. Yeah. That's right, and an indication of what they would do. It was heavy stuff, and you could understand why people got so angry. But you asked about this uh, because we were talking about China and yes. China getting fed up. Yeah, um, it's it, when you talk to Chinese experts about North Korea. Uh, you, it's very hard to find one who doesn't you know, roll his eyes and say, you know, wretched North Koreans or choice words to that effect. Yeah. Uh, there's not a lot of love lost. A lot of Chinese, at least kind of below the top elite level, seem to feel trapped in a relationship, you know, like a really bad marriage that they can't quite get out of, but that they really don't like. And the, the result is that China weathercocks. I mean, I don't think China is about to abandon North Korea, uh, but the the ban on imports of North Korean coal earlier this year was more than a slap in the face. I mean, this was a body blow to the North Korean economy, uh, if followed through for the whole year, which is what China said it will do. Right. Uh, and the fact that China has voted for uh, the sanctions resolution, I mean, you can't yeah, pass sanctions resolution. That's sort of tangible, isn't it? It's, it's something I've done on paper to vote against a, a, maybe an ally that they would have been you know, certainly hesitant to condemn in the sort of um, public eye internationally yeah. until then. China gives North Korea a fair bit of aid, doesn't it? That's my understanding is that like they do send quite a bit of aid shipments. Yes, they do. Uh, the numbers aren't published. Uh, Chinese tell me that over half of the total Chinese aid budget still goes to North Korea, which causes a lot of headaches. I mean, firstly, uh, this is a lot of money full stop. And, you know, China's not a democracy. Let's, you know, let's not get misty yes. about this. But you do get internal social pressures. And people ask, why are we giving all this money to foreigners when we have lots of poor Chinese still? 
absolutely. And, you know, it's, it's a question the regime struggles to answer. The other thing is that China is expanding its international links and is looking for ways to lubricate uh, profitable trade and strategic links with countries in Africa and Latin America. And people go to the aid budget and find that actually it's all been spent, all begin to North Korea. And people who are trying to develop what is probably China's future yes. get very cross about this. You know, why should the Koreans have money that we could actually use, much smaller amounts indeed, you know, and win friends in African countries where we really do need them? So yeah, there's a, a lot of question marks over that. And I think as well, one of the things, again, from my own very brief experience in the country, I was travelling on the sort of piggybacked onto a Chinese tour. So there was an English-speaking tour guide um, and a Chinese-speaking tour guide, but there's only like three of us from the UK and the rest was just, you know, Chinese people that didn't really speak English. But um, one of the things I did manage to, well, once chatting to some guy in some broken English, was that they have a lot of nostalgia for, for uh, Chairman Mao and the communist Marxist style leadership, which I thought, you know, especially in the West, you see Chairman Mao as the kind of the top of the sort of genocidal, um, in terms of body count at least, you know, being a complete tyrannical nightmare. And, and that was what I found quite interesting is that they had this sort of nostalgia for a truly authoritarian leader in Kim Jong-un and, and another thing that was just absolutely fascinating was that the, the political relationships between say England and China uh, sorry England and North Korea compared to China and North Korea was quite telling because they were getting told different information on the tour guide through the uh, respective tour guides were Chinese speaking one and the English speaking tour guide and some of the things they were being told were just the opposite of what we were being told and it was just because there was a slightly more cosy relationship mm. with China and North Korea they were sort of getting um, extra info that they were telling us the complete opposite. I mean, one example which springs to mind was I remember being on a coach and going through a sort of fairly arid part of the country and just hearing one of the young Chinese tourists just start laughing. And I asked him why he was laughing. And they uh, said that a Chinese tour guide had said, or Chinese speaking tour guide, had said that North Korea was obviously the cradle of civilization where the first human remains were ever found. But then we would re try and verify this with our own tour guide and they go, no, no, that's not true. That's completely not true. And that was quite interesting that how your own national identity, you would get a different version of the tour in the country, or at least yeah, different facts. <laughs> maybe or then again, maybe not. Uh, <laughs> firstly, uh, Chinese who choose to spend precious holidays and Chinese don't get many holidays yes. in North Korea are a self-selecting group. I mean, most Chinese, if they're going to go abroad, they'll go and flop on a beach in the Philippines or Vietnam yeah. or something. To actually want to spend your time in North Korea says something about the Chinese that you're talking to. That is a valid point. I'll and, give you that. Uh, the, the Chinese you tend to meet on these tours tend to be either you know, serious uh, retro left-wingers who think that Mao was the greatest, um, in the same way you get people in Russia who think that Stalin was great, but, you know, takes all sorts, I guess. Uh, it's kind of an all-inclusive nostalgia dictatorship package. Yes, if you like. Uh, if you like. Um, that, or sometimes just get people who are curious. A lot of Chinese have told me that, uh, particularly older Chinese who've been to North Korea, that it reminds them of their childhood. North Korea is like China in the 70s, yes. Which is so there's a nostalgic yeah. element to it, I suppose. A sort nostalgic of element to it, yes. view of how their country was. Yes. Was nostalgia is always... Although it never was. I mean, I was in China in the 70s. I mean, I, um, yes. And it, it was never like North Korea. Uh, in, in, in straight what way? Straight, in, you know, in straight, straight after the Cultural Revolution, you know, I could go and sit in Chinese homes and drink tea with people yeah. and, and chatter away, and people weren't scared. You know, In North Korea, to go and see a North Korean in their home is really dangerous. Uh, not for you, well, I, was a diplomat. I was protected by the Vienna Convention. For the North Korean concerned, that would have been a very foolish thing to do. The, you know, they'd have been denounced and probably sort of slept off to somewhere rather nasty. Uh, and is that because you were a foreigner, or is it just because they were... a foreigner, yeah. Yes. I can remember parts of the book where you explain that you know people would cross the street if they're on the you know one side of the road if they saw you coming. Yes. Um, do you think part of it as well was just fear of perhaps saying the wrong thing or? I think that's a big part of it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that if you, I mean, you get North Koreans who really want to get to know foreigners because they're curious because they uh, want to find out about the outside world and, and so on, or just because yeah. they're friendly. That happens too. Uh, but for a lot of North Koreans, you know, they'll calculate and they'll think, you no. Know, Nothing good is going to come out of me meeting this foreigner. Yes. Why should I ruin my day? I suppose it's all risk and no potential exactly. gain. It's isn't all it? downside. Yeah. Come back to your second point. National identity. It might have been national identity. To be honest, I suspect this is just another example of how different North Koreans are from each other. Um, if there is a line you're supposed to take with foreign tour groups, it probably does a little bit ragged yes. and leaves a certain amount of scope for individual imagination. And quite possibly, the English-speaking tour guide was 
straighter than the Chinese one. Uh, there is an official North Korean claim that North Korea, uh, the Korea, the Korean Peninsula, is the center of world civilization. And if you pay some silly amount of money, yeah. you can go and see the supposed remains of Tangon, who was the arch progenitor of the Korean race. He has a huge wow. tomb quite near Pyongyang. Um, but I'm afraid that some people suspect that this is all a massive, massive fake. And for the English-speaking guide to uh, to say, actually, this isn't true, probably was quite courageous. We were definitely getting a sort of slightly different version of events, and yeah. especially when it came to the history part of things, because we, you know, we had to go to the military museum and bow to an incredibly huge wax sculpture of Kim Jong Un that was um, that was certainly complementary to his weight at the time. It was yeah, it was absolutely just four days of complete propaganda. I mean, to to leave North Korea and, and kiss the floor of authoritarian China. Certainly, you know, it says yeah. a lot about the, I suppose, the totality of the regime and, um, and, and just in every aspect of Korean life, really. So moving on to Trump, because we have to. Yes. How do you picture the Trump administration dealing with Pyongyang? How we don't know. Nobody knows because Trump, the Trump administration is at the moment in the throes of a grand review of North Korean policy, uh, which, unlike everything else about the Trump administration, has not leaked. Uh, so we don't know what is being proposed or what will be proposed. It hasn't actually formally reported yet, uh, nor does it have a, a strict date for reporting. So we might be kept hanging for days, weeks, while the Trump administration makes up his mind what to do. Yeah. Uh, the, I haven't heard anybody suggest, though, that, uh, that President Trump is up for, for big dialogue with North Korea. Remember no. we had that, that remark on the campaign trail about having a Hamburg with Kim Jong-un? Um, Vaguely, which, yes, but there was, there was quite a few sort of uh, memorable moments of the campaign trail. You're right. Trump. I mean, <laughs> you're right. But anyway, we've heard no more of that ever since. Uh, right. And all, I mean, insofar as Donald Trump's tweets reflect official yeah. US government policy, on which you, know, you could have a long debate, but uh, they, they don't indicate any wish to engage in deep dialogue, much more a toughening against North Korea and real irritation with the kind of things that North Korea is doing. So I think we all have to wait and see, uh, see what the report concludes. And of course, a key point, whether Donald Trump accepts it. I mean, he's the president. Uh, and, yes. you know, he, he's quite within his gift to say, yes, a fascinating report, but no thanks. So watch this space. The, the, the stability and sanity of the North Korean regime. Go. Uh, it's, uh, firstly, can we get one thing straight? Kim Jong-un is not mad. Uh, he's actually, he may not be as bright as his father right. or possibly his grandfather, uh, but he's not insane. He calculates. He has definite uh, identifiable foreign policy objectives, which he is quite determined to achieve. Um, he, the, the rhetoric that comes out of Pyongyang yeah. is hyperbolic because it always has been. And the North Koreans have got themselves in a position where if they stop using all these really fiery adjectives, then people are going to start analysing their texts and saying, hey, they've climbed down this position or they're not as strong on that. So they're now hoist by their own patar. They've got to keep saying these things. And I suppose there's big get... boots to fill from um, Kim Jong-il. Like you say, if you water down the rhetoric, the anti-imperialist Americans and what have you, that could be shown as a sign of weakness. And I suppose yeah. dictators, like all dictators, are in the game of, of staying in power. Big boost to Phil. I, I'm not at all sure that Kim Jong Un sees it that way. I think he's very keen on being his own man and carving out his own niche in history, as, as he would see it. Uh, but he's he, he's not stupid. He calculates, and sometimes sometimes he gets it right, sometimes he gets it wrong. The problem with the regime is not insanity. Yes. Um, it is the it's a groupthink and the fact that you have got critical world decisions being made by a fairly small number of people. Uh, none of whom really understand the way the world works. I mean, a grip of you know the dynamics of, for example, United States politics yes. uh, is, is 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 lacking. Uh, the the way they talk about the United Nations, you know, they actually believe that the United Nations is simply controlled by the United States. Yes. I'm sure the people in Washington just you know, wish that things were so simple. I um, think there's people on the left in this country that probably think that. I think Noam Chomsky oh, yeah. believes that. I think that there's a sort of air of conspiracy that has crept into what is sort of mainstream political view now. Um, so it's often, I do think it's interesting how some people on the left in this country start to sound more and more like, um, you know, despots trying to blame everything on America or at least American foreign, foreign policy. Um, but sorry, carry on, I interrupt yeah, you. Yes, yeah, sure, no, d d delusions of this kind are, are not the sole prerogative of the North Korean regime. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Kim Jong-un is not, he's not stupid, but he's nothing like his father. And this has been a big change for okay. everybody dealing with North Korea. Kim Jong-il, 
Let, let, let me start out at the beginning. I, I'm not a Kim Jong Il fan. Don't get me wrong. Right. But he was consistent and predictable. He was, in many ways, rather like the old Soviet Union. You could hate it, but you would know roughly what Brezhnev was going to do yes. in any given situation because the Soviet Union, for a president, had its own internal rule books, its own internal procedures, and they, they, there was predictability there. Also, Kim Jong Il was a real workaholic, a notorious for sitting up until the small hours going through paper after paper wow. after paper. Nobody sneezed in North Korea without Kim Jong-il knowing about it. Right. Kim Jong-un is very different. Uh, he doesn't do the, the small hours interest stuff. Right. Much more interested in spending time with his family. Uh, quite happy to delegate things, which means that you know the number of people actually able to, to influence, and in some cases doubtless make decisions, is probably rather greater yes. than it was under Kim Jong Jong-il. Um, also, uh, much less prone to have the complex love life of Kim Jong-il. Kim Jong-il had, how many we counted, three, three women with whom he had progeny. Um, yes. And, and probably you know, numerous other mistresses. Uh, people I know who know Kim Jong-un uh, tell me that he is monogamous. Now, he's, he's really completely devoted to his wife, his kids, and you know, there's no, he's not going to waste time and energy uh, going off uh, chasing other women. Uh, so that again, a, a big difference. And yes. as the dynasty unfolds, that's going to matter more and more. Uh, and there is—is is there some truth in the claim that Kim Jong Un's first wife was executed on charges of watching pornography? This is the one that's thought of been banded around in Western she, no, media. She, she, I, I don't think that's true at all. No. Uh, firstly, I, I have no idea whether she watched pornography or not, but right. I, I don't think she got executed. The, the problem is that a lot of these stories come out of the South Korean media. Now, I, I love the South Koreans. I, mean, I, I go there quite often and they're great people. Yes. But uh, standards of journalistic ethics in South Korea uh, are not always what they might be. And there's certainly and, a bias to probably exaggerate or at least, um, you know, make the regime look bad. I mean, it's a sort of... Oh, still... it's not that. I mean, yeah, there might be that in some cases. It's, yes. it's, this is more, it's journalists trying to get a scoop. Right. Yeah. And if you have to invent a bit or embroider, you know, not all South Korean journalists are so uh, <laughs> scrupulous well, as to resist that kind of temptation. Yes. Uh, okay, uh, particularly when dealing with North Korea, because one of the things about reporting on North Korea is it's actually quite easy to put out stories that may sound slightly strange, but you can never actually disprove. Hard to verify anyway. Hard to verify anyway, yes. No collateral. Nobody can ring up and do a fact check on. No yep. one's going to sue you for libel. No one's going to sue you for libel. <laughs> and so people who are inclined to invent stories yeah. uh, will go off and do just that. Now, was she executed? I've seen no evidence at all that she was. Uh, no real evidence either that the relationship between her and Kim Jong-un was ever really serious. I mean, they, they, they may have been boyfriend girlfriend at some stage. Who knows? I mean, presumably, yeah. I, I don't know whether uh, his present wife was his first love. Uh, but, you know, is that strange? Uh, but the idea that she was sort of taken off a machine gun, I think we need to be very careful of. Worth noting that there have been several celebrated instances in the past where we've had South Korean reports of lurid executions of high-level officials who, a year or two later, so reappear very much alive. Oh, wow. And it turns out that they, they, they were punished, but they were punished by rustication, by being sent out of Pyongyang. And Photoshop. Perhaps they were deleted out of a few military ceremonies and what have you. Yeah, I've oh seen no, <laughs> Photoshop, yeah, photoshopping happens. I sentence you but, to uh, pho digital deletion, as it were. Digital deletion, <laughs> yeah, but all quite often you, you know that they're in trouble because they don't appear and the photos yeah. are genuine. And, and this is the regime signaling that this guy is out. Yeah. But out doesn't mean dead. And there was, for example, a former, uh, a former premier um, who was thought to have been executed and then, was it two, three years later, reappeared. It turned out that he had been sent off to run a chemical factory somewhere out in the sticks. Right. So probably not as much fun as, as you know, the kind of power and prestige he had in Pyongyang, but certainly wasn't a labor camp. He was certainly alive. Yes. And you know, he, was, he was on a salary and you know, he was still the <laughs> boss of something a bit smaller. So just a kind of a slap in the face and a warning to behave better in the future. I think that happens quite a lot. And there's a sort of a knock-on effect as well with the Western media because I've noticed so many stories on The Guardian um, and other websites. Uh, sort of things to do with like North Korea claiming they won the World Cup, um, the ex-defense minister being fed to a pack of wild dogs, and it will always be in the headline, um, but in inverted commas, so it's basically passing on a claim from either a Chinese or a South Korean newspaper, but that has, right. that has a real, you know, in, in the age of fake news where people's attention spans is getting smaller and smaller online, 
that has a knock-on effect that people will just believe it at face value. They won't even notice the inverted commas. They'll just see that in the headline and run with it. And I think yeah. I've definitely been guilty of that myself in the past. But it does have this knock-on effect, I think, definitely. Yeah, the, the, the example you gave just now of um, you know, being ripped apart by a pack of dogs, you can trace back. It was actually put out by Chinese spoof paper, which is known. It's about it's a, a kind of um, something between uh, Private Eye and uh, Charlie Hebdo. Right. Uh, and it, it does kind of, um, it, you know, avowed spoofs. It was never meant to be serious journalism. It was a joke. Right. And Western journalists saw this right. and reported it as fact. I mean, the, the perils of Google Translate, perhaps. The of Google, well, well, Google Translate, or simply not reading the headlines. You know, yeah. this was not, this is not news. This is just a fun story we've made up. Yeah. You know, just a, a kind of um, uh, a, a kind of rather gothic version of North Korean life. It never was meant to reflect the truth, but nevertheless, it got picked up. And I've been asked a dozen times whether it's true. It's not. There's right. no uh, uh, the way that. If you are executed in North Korea, yes. very important to remember that North Korea, um, repressive, uh, shut down, all these things. But it is also a regime that runs on rule books. Right. Yes? Everybody knows what the correct thing to do is in certain circumstances. And you do not deviate from those rules. To do so is dangerous. Yes. That applies to killing people as much as to anybody else. And there are quite specific ways that you are allowed to execute people. They involve shooting them. You shoot people in North Korea. You do not feed them packs of dogs, anything like that. And traditionally, you are shot with three bullets, one through the head, one through the chest, and one through the, the abdomen. Right. Uh, and you are tied to a post, and each bullet will cut a rope, so that when, you're, when, when the third bullet goes in, you slump forward and you're dead. And that's the way it's done. That's the rule. So in your opinion, the dogs thing, just, just as that as a key example, not true? Absolutely not true. Not in my opinion. Trace the source back. In terms of North Korea's nuclear, potential nuclear arsenal, is it a threat to the West? Is it a threat to future international relations or at least you know, global security? What should Western governments do in, you know, with respect to North Korea's nuclear arsenal? Okay, wow, that's a big one. It's a big um, one. The big one. Look, <laughs> the, let's start with the first part of the question first. Is it a threat? Absolutely it's a threat. Uh, there is, we, we say that North Korea um, is not transparent, which is true. Yeah. Um, you, it's not always easy to get information out of the country. But to be honest, a lot of the problem is not that North Korea is not transparent, but that North Korea said very clearly what it is doing and why, yes. and the world tries desperately not to hear it. In the case of nuclear weapons, um, there is the, the default position amongst analysts has tended to be that this is a bit like the Cold War. This is all yes. about deterrence. And it follows, therefore, that you, you, you come to the conclusion that if North Korea is not threatened, then it won't use its nuclear weapons. That is not what the North Koreans have said. They haven't actually published a full nuclear doctrine. But they have been honest so far, I suppose, is, they in, have been, in, that's right. in their ambitions. And, and yeah, and, and they, you know, what they've said they'll do, they've done. And what they have said about their nuclear weapons is that this is for first strike. This right. is not for deterrence. I mean, it probably has a deterrent effect too, but yes. that's not why they got them. It's an inverted they, one, I suppose, isn't it? If they either their sovereignty is infringed yeah. or, uh, as now appears to be the case, because North Korea, North Korea faces a long-term existential problem. It knows that if South Korea continues to exist, at some point, North Korea will disappear. Right. You know, that life's just like that. You, know, you cannot live with the other half of your nation uh, enjoying a massively higher uh, economic success, yeah. a stand higher standard of living, international respect, all the international and so on. Uh, because in, at some point, you're going to get taken over. Therefore, to survive, North Korea needs to destroy South Korea. Now, it, it can't persuade South Korea to reunite with North Korea on North Korean terms. I no. mean, that just is... No, this is not going to happen. So the only way it can solve this problem is by invading South Korea. And to do this, it needs to prevent the United States from reinforcing its South Korean ally. Yes. And it said, you know, we were talking just now about the missiles. Yes. Uh, it will use nuclear weapons to prevent reinforcement and to intimidate the United States into believing that if it continues to help South Korea, then uh, a mushroom cloud appears over an American city. And is it really worth it? So, yeah, I, and North Korea doesn't seem to be ready for a war yet. No. But that is the long-term ambition. Because, I mean, on the face of it, I would say I was probably far more concerned about maybe, say, Pakistan's nuclear arsenal, which was, you know, obtained through illegal means just like North Korea's. Um, 
but there's since been voiced concerns about you know the security of just them being in Islamabad or wherever they are. But I mean, what you say about South Korea and and in terms of it being a first strike, I mean, yeah, there's not really an aspect of it I thought about before. I always kind of assumed that this was, as you say, purely a deterrent. But it's fairly scary stuff. I'm sure you'll agree. I mean, it's it is it's it is. I mean. The- there's a terrible risk that we treat North Korea as a joke. This really, really is not funny. No. And if there is a live use of a nuclear weapon, the chances are that it's going to be a North Korean nuclear weapon. How much of a threat this is to the West. Yeah. If anybody detonates a nuclear weapon in anger, that is a major blow to world security. Absolutely. Um, you, it is very difficult in that kind of situation to prevent nuclear escalation. Uh, you would probably have a series of uh, nuclear attacks. Yes. Uh, it's, the United States would be in the firing line if the North Koreans could actually uh, manage to get them, their nuclear bombs that far. And there's a lot of argument at the moment about how close they are to that objective. Right. Western Europe, probably not. But we would, at the very best, be living in a world where we had just had a nuclear exchange. There would be problems of an environmental contamination and everything. I mean, these things let off enormous amounts of radioactivity. Of course they do. Um, but worse than that, we would have established the readiness uh, to use nuclear weapons. At the moment, the use of nuclear weapons, most people would regard as unthinkable. Yeah. Once you start doing it, it's no longer that, is it? That's it. It's a, it sets a precedent for apocalyptic weapons. I mean, it's, it's, it's a terrifying concept. Yeah. Um, so moving on, one of the things I've been thinking about is the advancement of technology and how that's sort of making the job of any dictator across the world harder, be it social media. Um, obviously, I know North Korea has no internet or maybe some form of government um, intranet. But do you think as technology advances that Kim Jong-un will find it harder to you know, have control over his people? I mean, I'll give you one example. I read a piece recently, um, I think it was in the New York Times, about pen drives, so USB sticks, that were being snuck in, snuck in, snuck in, is that the word, snuck in? (laughs) Sneaked into the country, which were full of American films. Now, a lot of people, you know, sort of the sources are claiming that this is sort of reducing hostilities in some way. You know, you can take the government propaganda line of the imperialist West, but then again, if you're sat watching sort of American comedy, then surely that has got to go some way to improving relations, at least in the hearts and minds of the citizens, which again could be, you know, in my opinion, a, a loose sort of path towards revolution in some way. Would you agree with that? Yes. Uh, in general, as technology advances, it becomes more and more difficult for governments to keep information out. Yes. Uh, and this applies to North Korea as much as to anywhere else. Uh, thumb drives full of films. The American films come in. The the real demand is for South Korean films, right? Uh, because obviously the language and everything. Yes. But um, and uh, various of my North Korean friends were complete addicts of South Korean soap operas, right. which are about as daft as soap operas are anywhere else. But they still they translate over different borders somehow. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, but you, you and but they they are corrosive. Uh, you you watch these things and yeah. uh, even though sort of something inside you may be telling you that this is just fiction. Yes. Nevertheless, you are watching fellow Koreans uh, eating in the very best restaurants, all living right. in really smart apartments. You know, having these old sort of dream lives, and you sit there in your sort of, you know, your one room Pyongyang apartment where the heating isn't working that day. You know, what are you going to think? Yeah, so, yes, yeah. is this going to cause a revolution? It revolutions tend to happen where people calculate that it is worth throwing things into the sky and seeing where the pieces land. Yes, um, and I don't know whether the North. I mean, first of all. You're not going to get that out of North Korean countryside. We're not talking about a peasant revolt. These yes. people don't watch this stuff in any case. They're too poor. They're just too busy yes. trying to get the harvest in. Uh, but amongst the elites of Pyongyang, uh, are people ready for such a radical change? Very, very hard to tell. I think most people in Pyongyang know that despite years of North Korean propaganda, to the contrary, yes. that South Korea is massively richer than the North. So that is sort of widespread knowledge, isn't that it? That is now widespread knowledge. I remember once, um, the only time I came across a poster trying to make out the South Koreans were poor, I was visiting a school, a hospital school, I think it was, way out in the sticks, and right at the top of a kind of stairwell, where it must have been really difficult to get the poster up, let alone down, there yeah. was one poster uh, 
with showing ragged South Korean children right. uh, being brutalized by a hook-nosed Yankee soldier. Uh, and I've, the slow was the effect of, you know, pity our brethren in the South and, you know, yeah. your northern. And I sort of st stood and looked at this, and my North Korean escort came up, saw what I was looking at, and kind of you know, blood drained from the face. I wasn't supposed to see that. I sort of <laughs> hurried me on. I it's suspect now that it's considered satire, that poster now, I think, by the sounds of it. <laughs> yes, it might be considered satire. North Korea's not, not big on satire, to be honest, but it, it was certainly <laughs> wasn't the current propaganda line, put it that way. And uh, I think most North Koreans know that that is, is not the case. They know, too, that China is much... So there's a kind of trajectory going, I suppose, isn't there, of distrusting propaganda of the, from, the, from their government? Um, you know, like you say, if, if that poster was there and they kind of believed it, I mean, now pen drives coming in with soap operas, okay, yeah. you know, it might not be, like you say, sort of corrosive. But yeah, at the same time, they're, they're seeing the opposite of what the government's telling them. You know, they're yeah. seeing the outside world, you know, albeit for a soap opera, but nonetheless, there's a sort of you know, material wealth that's visible to them. Yes, that's right. And of course, you know, they start asking questions about, you know, why aren't they getting all these goodies? One of the big challenges that the North Korean regime faces is meeting rising expectations. Uh, that as this information gets in, people discover more and more things they haven't got. Now, if you go to Pyongyang now, yeah. I mean, it is, it's quite different from the way it was five, ten years ago. Uh, a lot more goodies to be had, a lot more sort of nice coffee shops, nice restaurants. Uh, people have better things in their, their flats, that kind of thing. Yeah. But... Uh, and this, I strongly suspect, is the regime trying to keep key constituencies sweet. Whether it can continue to do so, of course, depends on the economy, and the economy is in trouble. Uh, and you know, if the Chinese are going to not buy any more North Korean coal for this year, yes. then that's a terrible hole in North Korean finances. Well, and and you know, you, there, there comes a risk that there comes a point where people decide that actually, yes, things are a bit better than they were, but they're yes. not as good as they've seen in these South Korean films, and you know, maybe. After all, if the regime fell, it might be in their interests. Just back to the coal thing you mentioned there, what do they have to offer in terms of resources to, to trade? Most exports of coal and iron ore. So it, it's, a, it's a neo-colonial relationship that they supply raw materials to the Chinese industrial machine. Right, and now that China's sort of um, turned the tap off, so to speak, that, that could have some real ramifications, I'm yeah. guessing. I mean, economically and therefore politically, I suppose, in a country that's... Um, his economy is so sort of Absolutely. tepid and it's I mean, depending on whose figures you believe, uh, coal exports to China account for between a quarter and a half of all North Korean foreign currency earnings. Wow. So it's big. Yeah, absolutely. That's a question, actually. I mean, has anyone else as a Westerner or, say, any foreign diplomat ever lived in Pyongyang for two and a half years like yourself? Has that ever happened? Yes. Is yes. That, I, I mean... Because I'm uh, guessing the diplomatic relations that were, you know, sort of achieved with having an ambassador, that's fairly recent, isn't it? We haven't always had an ambassador based in Pyongyang. Since 2002, I think it is. Right, okay. Well, since it, we had, we've had a, a presence there since 2002. I, uh, now my history gets, uh, gets a bit blurry. I think the first ambassador arrived 2003. Right. Well, I could be wrong on those days. I need to go and check them. But yes, they, we've been around there for quite a while. Remember, in, it's, it's difficult to, to think yourself back to those days, but at the turn of the millennium, yes. there was a real sense that North Korea was reaching out, wanted to change, and the South Koreans were going around asking everybody, please, to respond to this right. and to set up embassies. Uh, and so various European countries did just that. Uh, because Bill Clinton had a plan to sort of bring them in from the cold, did he not? Or was it Bill Clinton? Had it not it? been for Monica Lewinsky and that cigar, Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, the world might have been uh, such a different place. Yes. Uh, he was, I mean, yes, he had plans, the great plans for a summit. Uh, possibly Bill Clinton visit as president to North Korea. That was being discussed. Right. Uh, but of course, he was far too busy facing impeachment hearings, wasn't he? Yes. And there, that went out of the, out of the window. Uh, but they were, they were close to actually sealing the deal. That was then. Uh, that doesn't sadly mean that that kind of deal is achievable now. I, I mean, I, I can't help but feel that a golden opportunity was lost in those moments, but it probably won't come back. What do you think would have to change for, for there to be any hope of a sort of diplomatic, I don't want to say solution, but at least a, a diplomatic resolution to the tensions on the Korean Peninsula, let's say? You would need the North Korean regime to be convinced that there was a better option for securing its safety and survival than nuclear weapons. And right now, that kind of option simply is not on the table. They've, they've watched the, what happened to places like Iraq and Libya, Ukraine for that matter, uh, who gave up nuclear weapons. 
and uh, they, they, they draw appropriate lessons. They also, uh, coming back to the conversation we were having a minute ago about use of these weapons, uh, they have also drawn the conclusion that faced with United States firepower, you can never defend yourself with conventional weapons. You no. have to use nuclear weapons, which is a bit disquieting. And it's the only deterrent that really, I mean, from the accounts that you hear, I mean, most of their military hardware, I assume, is pretty antiquated. It's sort of ex-Soviet yes. stuff. and the conventional stuff. Is, uh, Kim Jong-nam killed with nerve gas. Yes. Yeah. There, and uh, one of the big puzzles was why... This was um, sarin gas, is it? Or like, do they call VX VX, poison, that's right. Yeah. Well, no, sarin, the kind of 1980 technology. This, VX is a bit more modern. Right. But, I mean, I don't want to dip down, down rabbit hole. <laughs> There's chemistry guess in there. Chemistry, yeah. <laughs> but the, one of the big mysteries was... Uh, if he was killed by having VX smeared on his face, yes. why did it take him 20 minutes to die? And why did the young woman who did the deed survive? She disappeared into um, a lady's restroom yeah. and washed her hands. But I mean, you know, you touch VX, you just go and, and, and down. And a, a lot of sort of, you know, head scratching. Yes. The best guess is that the problem was they were using North Korean VX. Right, okay. And the North Korean <laughs> VX, lot of it, probably thousands of tons, made some time ago, stored in North Korean storage conditions. Past its sell by date also, I imagine. Past its sell by date. <laughs> Badly degraded, nothing like as potent as fresh VX. Right. And that probably is why uh, the North Koreans were so upset about the event. That young woman was never supposed to live. She was offered some petty sum of money, probably lots of her, but the North Korean hit squad yes. sent to take out Kim Jong-nam assumed that she touched the VX, killed him, and dropped out herself. And that's it. There's your witness gone. Uh, well, I was going to say... The fact like that a... she was picked up by the Malaysian police and is actively cooperating, because, of course, she's charged with murder, and wasn't part of their plan. She's claiming, as well, that she was offered the money and it was part of the TV show prank, something along those lines? Yes, maybe, maybe not. I mean, heaven knows what they told her. Some, well, and I suppose she, they wouldn't expect her to be around to sort of fact-check yes, their exactly. of events, were they? That's right. No, but clearly, I mean... It, Kim Jong, Kim, Kim Jong Nam. Look, killing anybody using nerve gas in an airport terminal yes. is a horrible thing to do. Yeah, I mean, it was crowded. Other people could have been killed. Uh, but you're quite apart from the, that basic fact, it was a complete screw up. Uh, they, they they killed him. All right, but they, the witness survived, right. and they you know they're able to interrogate them. They arrested one of the the, the key people. Um, they've got the others holed up in the North Korean embassy in Malaysia. Right. The whole thing's been a disaster. And there was a, 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 the day after the assassination, Kim Jong-un appeared on television uh, at one of the eternal political meetings he's always addressing. Normally, at the end of these meetings, Kim Jong-un sort of smiles at the comrades, does a kind of little sort of dictator-like wave and sort of goes off, off stage and everybody leaves with a kind of warm glow in their tummies about what a nice guy he is. On this occasion, nothing of that. He scowled, no little wave. He was and just stomped off. He was not a happy man. Wow. And I would lay money that that was because a couple of hours earlier he had been told about the mess up of the operation. There's a witness, effectively, I suppose. To... There's a witness. The Malaysians are furious. You know, we've got the Americans after us. Uh, they've caught one of the North Koreans. You know, really, this was not by the, this was not the plan. Amazing. Well, thank you very much for chatting to me today, John. This is John Everard, and I strongly recommend picking up his book, which is Only Beautiful Please, and it's a British diplomat living in North Korea. Highly recommend it. John, thank you very much. Thank you, Ross. Thank you.